shaven. Okay, um, so we'll continue. Um, so we're going to look at two more principles, and that is um, the partnership principle, right? Um, third one being the partnership principle, and uh, the one, um, the next one being the, the satisfaction principle. So um, let's watch. Um, Let's watch a video. Probably this will be the uh, last uh, couple of videos by John C. Max Maxwell that we are watching together. Uh, so let's watch these videos and then have a time of discussion. Right? Um, let me share the video with us. Partnership principle. Working together increases the odds of winning together. Or as tiny Mother Teresa said, you can do what I cannot do and I can do what you cannot do. Together we can do great things. And the question you must ask yourself, are others better off because of their partnership with me? And my journey to understanding the partnership principle begins like this. Number one, I want to make a difference. Like many people, I started out in what I call the self stage. My focus was on me and what I could do. That's not to say I was doing anything wrong. My motives were positive. It's just that my perspective, along with my effectiveness, was so limited. Then I went to stage two. I want to make a difference with people. When I began to look at myself, I discovered that I could go farther and achieve more when others joined me on their journey. And as a result, I wanted to take everybody with me. It didn't take long for me to realize that was a mistake, and here's why. Not everyone should take the trip. Passion. Have you ever worked with people who said that they were on board with you and believed in what you were doing to accomplish, yet you kept having to talk them into doing their part? Those people have no passion for their work. They may want to take the ride, but they have no interest in peddling. Take them on and you will wear yourself out. Not everyone wants to take the trip. That deals with attitude. Some people just don't believe in you or what you're doing. That doesn't mean you're wrong or it doesn't make them wrong. It just means you shouldn't try to take them with you. Not everyone can take the trip. Ability. The difference between a partnership, oh, this is a great statement. The difference between a partnership and a rescue mission is capacity. Some people may want to make a difference, but they have no ability to affect what you're doing. You cannot afford to partner with someone with who there is no fit. The main lesson I learned during this phase is that I should try to build relationships with everyone, but I should forge partnerships with only a few. So I've gone from I want to make a difference to I want to make a difference with people to number three, I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference. English statesman Henry Van Dyke observed, in the process of personality, first comes a declaration of independence, then a recognition of interdependence. Number four, I want to make a difference with people who want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference. Only at this stage in my life have I entered what I call the significant stage. I have many rewarding relationships, partnerships, and together we are doing many things that are making a positive impact by helping others. I can't imagine anything more rewarding. Rabbi Harold Kushner remarked, the purpose of life is not to win. The purpose of life is to grow and to share. When you come to look back on all that you have done in life, you will get more satisfaction from the pleasure you have brought into other people's lives than you will from the times that you outdid and defeated them. I believe that to be true. Not too long ago, about 10 years ago, I crossed an important line in my life. 
where one day I awaken to the fact that the success of others and what I can contribute to their success is more meaningful to me than my own personal success. That's the day that I change my definition of success. And I begin to understand that success for me is not personal success, but success for me is adding value to others and watching them be more successful. Now, what I understand about this journey, and what I understand about partnership is very simple. Life is very short, and it's difficult to accomplish significant things without others. So the quicker you and I understand the value of partnership and we look at others to complete us instead of others to compete with us, all of a sudden, life begins to take on a whole new dimension and it begins to compound immeasurably. I have a nonprofit organization called Equip. We're right now training one million leaders internationally. We're in Asia, Africa, getting ready to launch Europe. And I have these people who every six months go out and train and develop them and, and go to these international areas and take workbooks and spend two days and, and teach them. It's an incredible, incredible journey. And we train them and then we give them 25 workbooks on leadership and they go train 25 people. So every time we, if we teach to 1,000, we're really teaching to 25,000. And we not only give them the workbooks, but we give them another leadership book and begin to develop their library. And it's just an amazing process of what's happening. I don't have time to tell you that. But, but there are about 200 to 300 people that are core of making this vision a reality. Amazing, isn't it? 250 people, the core and responsible for training a million. And I have on this finger a ring that my wife designed, a special ring. It's called a Million Leader Mandate Ring. It's got the picture of the globe on the front of it because the world is our mission and training leaders is our passion. And those 250, when we finish completing training a million, we're going to go on a cruise together. We're going to spend a week. And it's in that setting one night my wife and I will take these rings and we'll give it to every person that's on this mission with us and then we'll break the mold so there'll never be a ring like it. Partnership. I can tell you this. You can do it alone if you want to, but it's not near as much fun. And if you do it by yourself, you won't be near as effective. People principle number 25. The satisfaction principle. The satisfaction principle basically says, in great relationships, the joy of being together is enough. In fact, a joy shared is a joy doubled. And the question I must ask myself is, do my closest friends enjoy just being with me? Jack Benny and George Burns were very good friends, and here's what George Burns said of his friend Jack Benny. Jack and I had a wonderful friendship for nearly 55 years. Jack never walked out on me while I sang a song, and I never walked out on him when he played the violin. We laughed together, we played together, we worked together, we ate together. I suppose that for many of those years, we talked every single day. I think all of us would love to have a relationship like Benny and Burns or like that of an older married couple that we've met, but how do we get there? The foundation is built upon all the previous people principles in this book. A lasting relationship begins as a healthy relationship. Beyond that, I believe that four factors help to create the right climate for relationships where simply being together is enough. Number one, shared memories create a bonded environment. Margaret and I have been married for over 35 years. When we 
entered in this marriage relationship, we never had an idea that I would be able to do what I've been able to do, travel where I've been able to travel. But I can tell you this, we determined that if I was ever going to go to some place exciting and she wanted to go, I'd take her with me. Now, in the first few years, when that happened, I had to borrow money because I didn't have any money. So I would borrow money from a family member and take those few hundred dollars and she would go with me on the trip because basically what we settled was very simple. I don't want us to come to the end of our life and somehow be on the deathbed and me tell her all the exciting things I've done. No, I, I'm not into that. I'm not into show and tell. I'm into let's experience it together. Number two, growing together creates a committed environment. Beginnings and endings are often much easier than the hard work of sustaining the relationships. Why? Beginning relationships possess the excitement of starting together. Continuing relationships possess the commitment of sticking together. But lasting relationships possess the joy of staying together. So what is the bridge that spans the gap between relationships that start together and those that stay together? The answer is growth. People who grow together become more committed to one another, and I think they are usually happier too. Number three, mutual respect creates a healthy environment. On her 25th wedding anniversary, Abigail Van Buren put the following letter to her husband in her syndicated Dear Abby column. Here's what she said. Dear Mort, today is a very special day for me. It's my 25th wedding anniversary. And I have this to say. I had a mother and father who really loved each other, so I know what love is. I've worked hard to see two teenagers safely through their traumatic teens, so I know what satisfaction is. I have prayed and my prayers have been answered, so I know what faith is. I have had by my side the kindest, gentlest, most considered human being I have ever known, so I know what joy is. I love you. Respect within a relationship creates a healthy environment because it produces two things. First, it creates trust. And as you know, trust is the foundation of all relationships. And second, it engenders servanthood. People almost can't stop themselves from helping and serving someone they deeply respect. As Albert Einstein said, only a life lived for others is worthwhile. Number four, unconditional love. Create a safe environment. Children's author Dinah Maria Murlock wrote, Oh, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but to pour them all out just as they are, chaff and grain together, knowing that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and then with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. When somebody loves you with no strings attached and no personal agenda, it is the most freeing thing in the world. It creates a safe environment wherever you are. It's just like I was on the plane the other day and somebody, Margaret was traveling with me, and somebody asked me, said, where's home for you? Because they surmised I travel a lot. I pointed over to Margaret. I said, wherever she is, that's where home is. Now, we have a house, but if I'm just with her, I'm home. I feel very fortunate to have Margaret. I tell people all the time that the greatest decision I ever made was to ask her to marry me. I think about that daily, and I try to tell her as often as I can. And on Valentine's Day 2004, I wrote her a note reflecting on our relationship, and she's given me permission to share it with you. Margaret, it was about this time 40 years ago that we started dating. Although each year seems to be going by quicker than the previous one, our lives have been filled with memories. At 56, I have forgotten many, but the special ones are still today very real to me. I ask myself, were the memories special because of what we did or because we experienced them together? The answer is both. The specialness was greater because we were together. When we are apart, I look forward to our telephone time each evening. It's the highlight of my day. Why? It's because... We both share our list of things that have happened to us that day. No, it's because we are once again together. 
I can well remember the anticipation I felt when we were courting as I drove from Circleville to Chillicothe for a date night with you. I could hardly wait. The years have not diminished the anticipation to once again see you after I've been gone. That's why I call you as I leave the airport on my way home. Margaret, the joy you display when you see me again has stayed strong over all these years. Every time I call you, answer the phone with the same excitement that expresses to me that I'm loved. I'll never forget the time you sold some of your high State textbooks and bought a bus ticket so that you could surprise me and we could have an evening together, or the time you traveled from Nepal to, to Delhi to spend an extra night with me. Those extra efforts to be together are what have made our marriage so successful. A relationship never stays the same. It either grows closer or apart. Forty years after ours began, we still like to be together. Let's take a walk to the mailbox. Love, John. Final review of the people principles for winning with people. The readiness question. Are we prepared for relationships? And I shared with you people principles that help you get prepared for those relationships. Then there was the connection. Okay, so partnership and the satisfaction principle. So we see that, um, you know, leadership uh, is much more than, you know, certain well-defined job descriptions or, you know, formal leadership roles and designations. Um, also, you know, it goes beyond, um, uh, you know, personal, uh, like, passion and vision and drive and motivation and all that. It goes beyond that. It is um, that when we uh, develop that ability to work with others, and as we have seen in all these, uh, you know, personal principles. So, so uh, you know, one or two things can happen when we look at these things. We uh, look at these principles, uh, and it, it is good. Like it's uh, definitely we have a self evaluation, and then you know, it just happens right when we think that okay, this this is something that I don't do, or this is something that I'm very good at, or this is something that I cannot do, right? Um, or this is something that this one area where I need to really work at. You know, probably, you know, you had uh, some of these things going on in your mind, some thoughts going on in your mind. Or how can I do this right? You know, how can I do this well? Um, so, um, so just wanted to share that that uh, leadership is beyond you know all that, uh, beyond just titles and designations. And I think we we realize that and we understand that. Okay, um, so just wanted to ask, you know, if, if there are any questions that you may have about partnership, principle, about satisfaction, or the other two principles that we looked at in the morning, the boomerang principle and the friendship principle. Right. Um, yeah, with regarding, uh, regarding partnership principle, you know, we see different uh, pictures in scripture, right? Um, especially 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul is uh, uh, telling the Corinthian church where the people are saying, okay, uh, it's about uh, there are factions and they are actually elevating the ministers of God beyond that their place, like in uh, in the church, in the sense they are saying that I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and um, and because of which there are divisions. And so Paul Paul uh, talks to them, and then he says, I mean, he writes to them, and he says. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 5, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. Okay. Um, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one receives his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Okay. So uh, he goes on to uh, give these various pictures of uh, how they work together. Right? He planted and Apollos watered. But it was God who gave the increase. 
right? And he goes on to say that he who plants and he who waters, they are one. And uh, he says, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's fields. So we are fellow workers, meaning we are colleagues or we are working together. So the whole thing of partnership or kingdom partnership, right? So we see that the partnership is very, very uh, crucial and important for, um, well, for fruitfulness in ministry, right? And uh, we understand, we um, also value each other's roles and what, what we bring in. And, uh, and because of which we are able to achieve um, a lot more, right? Um, if you look at Romans chapter 16, right, Paul writes about uh, the uh, various people whom he worked with, who were part of his team, and uh, whom he interacted with. Right? The whole chapter 16, starting with Phoebe, uh, and then he goes on to talk about different people, uh, and uh, he finishes with greetings from Timothy, from Lucius, and um, you know the one who has been writing it as Paul is dictating, you know, Tertius, um, and so on. So we see that uh, well, as much as Paul, you know, we look at Paul's life and we say, okay, he was a, uh, a very apostolic in his ministry, and there's so much that he, um, you know, achieved um, in such a short time by the grace of God and um, by his drive and really. You know, giving yielding to the grace of God, yielding to um, this. You know, I, he did much more, and that was, itself was the grace of God in him. So, as much as we admire all that, you know, we see that there were a whole lot of people who were whom he partnered with, and right? you know, whom he invested his life in, and uh, and we see the the obvious fruitfulness of it. You know, which means that uh, he couldn't have definitely couldn't have done it alone. Um, and all these people were somehow part of, you know, the whole church planting, um, the discipling, uh, building people's lives, uh, and teaching, impartation, everything. That there was this whole bunch of people who were who were partnering with him in some way or the other, right? So we we get to understand that. Um, yeah. So any any questions? Anything that you may want to share? Yeah. Okay, none at all. Okay, okay. Um, okay. So then, there are some questions that uh, you know we we might have. Um, um, like how, like when we're talking about shared memories, okay, let's say partnership. I mean, not partnership. Uh, talking about satisfaction, just being with people. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, you, the friendship is at a, at that level that uh, just being with people is is just enough, right? And there's so much of uh, just picture. You know, a, a team that is that has this dynamic, right? Uh, picture a team that has this kind of a dynamic. And it's a it's a great place uh, to be in, right? It's it's great to be leading such a team. It's great to be be part of such a team where, um, where the, where they have they're putting all this in practice, right? Where uh, especially the last one, where they're very happy being with each other. Right? It's not like they're draining each other off, and uh, you know draining each other of. Uh, strength or emotions and but it's actually they're all contributing and there's so much of joy just being together right the joy of fellowship uh, as we may call it right and this picture leading such a team or being part of a team right and um, and and the question is like uh, how do we get there right how do we get there how do we build such a team right and uh, there's no one pat, you know, one size fit all answer to it. We know that it is building a team is intentional. Um, building such a team is uh, is important, right? And it is going to take uh, a whole lot of investment of time and effort, 
time and it's uh, it's not a one time thing it's not just about recruiting getting people to sign up for the big task or those routine tasks but it's going to it's going to be a journey it's going to be a process right and it's it will face challenges uh, there will be some difficult decisions uh, along the way um, but uh, the thing is to to get there right um, and like uh, John C Maxwell uh, I think I, I really uh, my takeaway was that that not everyone is meant to go on that journey like not everyone wants to in the first place right because not everyone has that passion not everyone wants to do that um, secondly uh, you know it's about uh, ability also not everyone can right? uh, and also about uh, attitude not everyone has the attitude not everyone you know has the inclination to to actually be there but there are others who who want to and uh, and uh, and the best part is this you know, people can start by saying i don't have the passion for this right um i don't have the passion for this i don't have the attitude right attitude towards this uh, i don't have the ability right but all that can change okay not by being part of the team but being being part of the community right being part of the community i'm talking about a typical local church setting um, that can change the uh, the passion can grow the, the lord can light a fire it can actually just by association just by being with others uh, by just by receiving the word um, the, the lord can light a fire in them right and that's all people change right people receive the calling people receive discover the gifts and then something changes something ignites so they they on fire they are on fire to do the things of god and that's what happened to each one of us so uh, the passion that can change well the inclination the attitude uh, and the interest to do something that can also change right and uh, and uh, well and the ability the the uh, development of strength emotionally physically spiritually um the learnings that are required the giftings that need to be honed and developed all that can happen and uh, so you don't have to write someone off <clears throat> excuse me you don't we don't have to write someone off saying okay this person can or disqualify someone saying this person can never make it or can never be part of the team um because uh, the reality is that people can change like right? people do change and uh, and yes you know they they can make it they can make the journey and uh, and that's what happened for john mark in uh, you know for paul that's what happened right um, john mark was part of the the first missionary journey and uh, and uh, i think uh, uh, was it the first one or the second one i forget uh, we look at acts um, let's uh, yeah let's let's check it out okay so acts 13 um, we read about the first missionary journey, uh, Barnabas and Saul, they go and, uh, yeah, and it is uh, in the second missionary journey, I think, that, um, that John Mark um, comes with them, right? Okay. So we see that uh, John Mark actually deserts them. Uh, in the sense, he he goes back. He's not able to, uh, he's not able to continue on. So he he goes back, and as a result of it, you know, we know what happens. Um, Paul goes with Silas, and uh, we don't hear about Barnabas and so on, um, and so on. You know, we see that. But the fact is that John Mark, much later, uh, he he uh, actually joins them. Right, he uh, he joins Paul because Paul writes to uh, writes to um, writes in, the, in one of the epistles. He says that you know, bring John Mark for he is useful to me in ministry. So um, while Paul did not want to 
take John Mark on that particular missionary journey. Right? He did not want him to be part of the team. Something happened to John Mark. John Mark changed. John Mark's, uh, well, his uh, attitude changed. His ability changed. And so, so, so much so that Paul says that he is useful for me in ministry. So Paul was, uh, John Mark was actually adding value to the kingdom of God. He was adding value to the people of God. And uh, and we can say he was adding value even to the to the leaders, the ministers of God. So he had he had grown, he had changed, right? So we cannot write people off. Well, while they may not be part of um, the team or your team uh, or your leadership team, well, uh, while they are part of the community, uh, God can still work uh, in their lives. They can they can change. God can bring about change in them. Right? Okay. So, um, so maybe that was one question. You know, you know, there are these people, and uh, you know, can they ever be part of the team? Oh, yeah, we're still talking. We see the unreliability. We see the the lack of interest. We see the more than the lack of interest. We we see the up and down, the seesaw. You know, interest level going up, going down, going up. So there's, uh, uh, they're not reliable, right? So uh, they're in that stage. And so we cannot actually, uh, we cannot actually ask them to do some critical tasks. Tasks with, with, if it cannot be done, you know, it will have some critical consequences. So we cannot actually trust such people to do that thing. So, um, well, the thing is this, you know, while, in a certain season, it might seem very difficult where uh, we're not able to, you know, hand off those things, delegate, you know, those things um, to certain others in the team. Whereas, um, well, yeah, well, it might be difficult in that season, but definitely um, God can bring about change. Right? Um, it's two ways. Again, it depends as a person. To be able to receive, to be able to cooperate, to yield, to be wanting to change again, right? We're wanting to change, we're wanting to grow. Um, so it depends on the person. It's not automatic, but God doesn't give up, and so He will. So, so we should not also and be there uh, to to help, uh, be there to uh, enable them to grow, and uh, God will. Right, bring about the change, right? Because he brings the increase, right? Okay, um, right. Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, you know we have uh, some more time, and then we look at uh, the next uh, section, the next chapter, uh, which is about uh, section three, which is about teamwork. Okay, so we uh, we looked at working together, the value of working together, and uh, we're going to look at teams right so let me just share the notes um, okay. Um, okay it's coming up okay so we see uh, a team it could be just two or more individuals. A team can be a big team, but at least two people, and uh, they are act working together effectively. Okay, so that's if you want to define a team, that is it. That it, at least two people, uh, but they're working together effectively for a common cause or towards a common goal. Right? So uh, there are different acronyms. Uh, four teams like together everyone achieves more together each achieves more or together everyone achieves miracles and so on right so um, you know if, if you were to write uh, and this is something that you can try out if you were to write an acronym right and uh, by yourself you would I'm sure you would come up with a few but then if you would write it with the team, with two or three others, and if you had to, if you were to put an acronym, write an acronym for team or any activity, you see that there are more options, right? 
there are more options there are more um uh, uh more solutions so that's one of the things that we uh, we can look at as reasons for teams reasons for teams that we have more than one person which means there are more resources right and since people are skilled in different ways you have more ideas there is more talent more strength right so um so that's the thing so teams even if it's a small team if it is just one other person or it could be a highly functional highly skilled multi uh, you know multi level skills team um we see that they're able to do then just one right so uh, we to get an understanding of teams uh, we we need to understand the, yes a team doing you know well uh, a team if it is doing well if it is functioning well they can actually achieve more than what a single individual can achieve right if it is functioning well it is doing the right things in the right way and right? so we so that's the first understanding that we get and then we say okay so why teams at all right we this is the this is one of the reason secondly it increases the leader's potential right while the leader is leader is giving vision directing and uh, you know overseeing the 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 team the uh, the team can actually greatly increase the potential of the leader and why why does it happen uh, potential ability of the leader right um so it frees the leader to actually do what the leader is meant to be doing that is to lead the team right so uh, uh but there is um, the the routine tasks when the the, the mother may probably certain skilled abilities skill team skilled uh, tasks um processes that need to be done when the team leader when the team members actually take it up and uh, and carry it out responsibly it greatly enhances the potential of the leader okay and also minimizes at the same time minimizes the leader's weakness maybe the leader is not skilled in certain areas maybe that's not the area of strength right for example you can think of okay maybe um you know maybe the leader is not so good with numbers maybe it's not so good with calculations uh, and so if there is a person on the team who is good with that and the leader entrusts all those activities which involve numbers and calculations and, and you know and maybe budgeting and accounting and all that is entrusted to that person who's actually good at it and enjoys doing that right so it minimizes the leader's weakness the leader is not good at it so it actually in while increasing the potential it also increases minimizes the leader's weakness uh, in that area right when there's a team we always share the credit and uh, we all also share the blame it's credit for the wins credit for the successes and the blame is also equally distributed for the loss right if there is a loss if there is a failure if there's a inability to achieve accomplish what we set out to accomplish well there is equal responsibility in that as well because it's a team right um while uh so when when that sharing happens sharing of credits sharing of the not so good moments then that brings about humility right brings about humility and also a sense of community that that we are all together in this we share the good things and we also share the the pain of not reaching our objectives uh, the pain of failure right um so we we share both uh, if it is just an individual there's a whole amount of you know a lot of accolades and a lot of it could cause pride and also it can also cause a re- deep sense of failure you know it's you're the person who is responsible you're the person who did not do it so there could be a deep sense of failure as well right um when there's a team it also keeps the leader accountable for achieving the goals well, and the, and and also 
the members of the team, each and every member of the team, uh, is kept accountable for the task of for achieving the goal, right? Because it's it's a team. There are people who are holding each other accountable. Okay. okay the word of God, the Bible has many things to say about team. This is what we, uh, this is what we see. This is what we learn. Okay, Matt, Mark six and verse seven. The Lord, He called the twelve to Himself, okay, so that they would be with Him and that He might send them out. And then Mark six and verse seven says, "And He began to send them out two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits." Right. So if you if you notice, we see that at least two people are there. He sent them out intentionally two by two, so that they would go and do the work of ministry. He gave them power over the unclean spirits. Okay. Luke chapter 10, we see you know, this was the 12 that were sent. Then he appointed the 70. And again, he sends them out two by two. And uh, he sends them with this directive. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. Um, you know, And he sent them to places where he himself was about to go next. So it was kind of a preparatory thing. That, and he sent them out uh, with uh, to preach the good news, to, to heal the sick, and to cleanse the lepers, and so on, raise the dead, and so on. So he sent them out. The 70 also were sent out two by two. Okay. Um, Ecclesiastes 4 says, two are better than one we have, because they have a good re reward for the labor. If they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. So we see that the word of God has this to say about teams, and well, people did put it to practice. Okay, we um, read about delegation starting from you know from Moses' time. Uh, we see the whole thing of delegation and working together, people working together. We see in the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul, you know, worked with teams, ministry teams, and uh, and we just read just now. Romans 16, where a whole lot of people who had whom he had invested in and whom he partnered with and who worked together, right? So, um, so when it comes to um, you know when it comes to teams, when it comes to um, um, uh, getting things done or achieving objectives, we see that. Uh, you know, when with with we are given certain abilities, right? People have certain skills, um, and we have been vested with the gifts of the spirit to get the work done, right? To get the work of ministry done, and if we have a passion for it, you know, then we are a burning desire. And we are actually we are get to walk in it in a way it activates, energizes, and that's why we see one Corinthians fourteen and Paul says, "Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts," right? So, so that we can actually walk in the fullness of it. Desire the gift, so you receive it and you walk in it. Have a hunger for it. So the passion, a burning desire, uh, it's it energizes, right? And uh, of course, when it comes to courage. Courage tests our ability. Like when you have the courage, you actually put it to test. You actually work it out. But Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you know, um, God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? But of power and love and of and of boldness and great courage. And uh, that is also in the context of gifts. Yeah, that is in the context of gifts. So he's actually encouraging Timothy to use gifts and uh, to be bold in it and reminding Timothy that God has not given the spirit of fear. Okay, So when it comes to courage, courage actually tests these gifts, tests our abilities, tests our talents. We are able to put it to use. Right. So being teachable expands this. Right? Being teachable expands the uh, so if we are not close to the leading of the the Holy Spirit, if we are not close to learning uh, or receiving an impartation, well, when that expands 
the use of the gifts expands the the our abilities expands our knowledge expands on everything right it expands relationships influence it right? a good relationship uh, it influences it for the uh, either you're able to sharpen one another and say okay let's let's do this um it it in, we are encouraged to actually walk in it right um and then responsibility strengthens it strengthens our ability you know when we are responsible for certain things it strengthens it and when it comes to teamwork, a group of people working together, it multiplies it. Okay, there's an exponential uh, uh, aspect factor to it because each one who is gifted, each one who is skilled, each one who has abilities coming together and working together for the same cause then there is a multiplication. There's a everybody coming together and there's because you're able to do much more. And this much more with the skills, with the abilities, and the, you know, talking about spiritual gifts, it really multiplies. Okay. So if this is what teamwork is, and this is what teamwork can actually achieve. Then the question is why why is it that people there are people who avoid teams who avoid teamwork okay why is it that people still want to uh, maybe not work in a team and who still prefer to work alone right? there are those um, we we do encounter maybe you know we still prefer you know individually we still prefer to work by ourselves and do things by ourselves and rather than in a team why is it okay here are some reasons to consider okay first one could be pride where we are unwilling to admit unwilling to admit what that i cannot do everything you know, the thing is this that uh, while we might be capable god that god could have really graced us blessed us uh, with the ability to do a lot of things a lot more than most people, right? Maybe we are skilled in different things, and we are uh, we are we are able to do this. We are able to do that. We are able to achieve a lot in a short time. We are able to do this. At the same time, we need to understand that there's only so much I can do alone. So, if there is an unwilling to admit that, then obviously there is uh, an unwillingness to work in a team, right? Um, well, the second thing, uh, along with uh, uh, with that first reason, uh, could be an unwilling to admit, an uh, unwillingness to admit to um, the fact that there are others who can actually do a better job than us in the same task. Right. So if if there's an unwillingness to admit that we are unwilling to. Uh, to say that yes, this person can actually do a better job, you know, then then we uh, we will hold back. If uh, if you if you don't want to admit that, we will hold back from uh, giving them the other person the that particular task or working with that person um, to achieve that particular goal, right? So it could be pride. First reason it could be pride because of which people do not want to work with teams. Right? Okay. Second reason could be insecurity, meaning I don't want to empower others. I really want to keep us very tight control over everything. And maybe you know there's also a fear. You know, what if I get replaced? What if this person you know who is better than me then I they re they replace what I I'm bringing in, replace my place in the ministry, place in the organization, my place in the team, right? It could be insecurity. Okay, there are some more reasons, uh, but we'll stop here and uh, we'll pick this up next class. Okay. Um, thank you. God bless you. We'll meet again. Bye bye. Thank you, Pastor. Right. See you. Bye bye. Thank you, Pastor. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor.
Bye-bye, success. Bye. Mm-hmm.